Hi, I'm Kelsey Voigt. I'm the museum curator at James A. Garfield National Historic Site, just down the street, and also at Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I got my master's degree in library and information sciences with a specialty in museum studies from Kent State University. Say that five times fast. And I graduated in 2015. And then I got an internship with the Park Service. And I've been hopping around as a museum intern and then a museum tech and then eventually curator with the Park Service. Um, and I've been here now over at the site for just coming on four years. So it's pretty exciting. And so today we're going to be talking about caring for your Civil War era objects. So what I'm talking about today is preventive conservation. So that word that's half there is conservation. This is what the NPS practices. This is what I am an expert in. And this is what I'll be talking to you about today. So what is preventive conservation? Um, it's the range of activities that preserve museum collections. So that's a nice way of saying I'm managing risks, right? So I'm looking at an object and I'm saying, hey, this is in pretty good condition. What can I do so it stays that way? So that's different than, say, a conservator who can chemically alter an object, use harsh chemicals, or restore something. So I'm kind of that pre-conservation need. That's my lane. So the biggest risk to objects that we have in museums and at home uh, is the environment. And when I say the environment, I don't just mean temperature and humidity, which we'll go over quite ex extensively because those are two big factors, but also pests that are in the area and the exposure to light in an area. This picture here is a data logger. So a lot of museums, if you keep an eye out in exhibit spaces, you might see some of these or something similar. Uh, this thing is pretty fancy, so its job is every seven seconds, it takes a temperature and humidity reading and then stores all that information for me and I can pull it. Uh, and it's pretty important because I can start to see trends or when things might be going wrong. So if I'm say seeing that, oh wow, the humidity really skyrocketed on this day, oh it was storming out, that kind of makes sense, or maybe we have an HVAC problem. So at, at your home, with your collection, something this fancy won't be necessary, but keep being aware and keeping an eye on temperature and humidity is always a good idea, which again, we will talk about. Okay, guidelines for mixed collections. When I say mixed collections, I mean uh, we're storing objects made of different materials all together. So they're all housed in the same location. If you think of like the fanciest museum you can think of, like I don't know, the British Museum or something, in their storage, they're going to have these nice cabinets, and they're going to store like with like. So all glass objects will be in this cabinet, and it'll be set at 40% humidity and at 60 degrees, because that's what glass likes. However, we don't live in that world, really. Uh, we don't have that capacity. So, and I don't either, uh, at the in the museum collection. So we focus on a broader range, right, to kind of somewhat meet all of these needs. So when we talk about temperature and relative humidity, there's no single number I can give you that's gonna be like, yes, I'm gonna maintain at this exact number, but it'll be a range. The key here is that you keep things stable. A stable environment, whether, even if it's a particularly higher temperature or higher humidity, as long as it's maintained, will do less damage than a colder temperature that fluctuates or a drier humidity that also fluctuates. Uh, so it's a good you know, rule of thumb to aim for 30, between 30 and 65% of humidity, relative humidity and 60 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit in your area. And I know that's throwing a lot of numbers and technical information at you, but we're really gonna focus on what's gonna work best for you and sometimes the changes are really simple. If you have things stored in an attic, a basement, a garage, it could be as simple as moving those boxes out of those fluctuating spaces and into your conditioned home. Or if you don't have a conditioned home, into a space that maybe is, a, is darker and cooler. So we're gonna be looking at objects and materials from the mid 1800s. These materials, we've got paper, metal, textiles, wood, and photography. I'll be going over each of these. But I kind of want to ask and throw it out there, who has items at home that have been passed down through the family that you maintain or you keep? Anyone? 
Yeah. Yeah, you've got letters? We have letters from uh, 1933. Oh, fantastic. And you know who they're from, or who wrote them and who they were to? Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Anyone else want to share something they have? Yeah. A Civil War diary? That's amazing. Wow, what a find. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. I purchased it. It wasn't passed down, but a caged criminal. Wow. Very cool. Shabby, but it's cool. Yeah. Got a model 1861 Springfield rifle musket. Amazing. <laughs> wow. Very cool. You don't hear about that very often. <laughs> Yeah, so we all have everything we said, you know, we have different material types going on um, and that's kind of what we're going to go over. Does anyone have any photographs from around this time period? Okay, yeah, this can get pretty tricky, but we'll talk about it. Um, and then after, you know, if you have any specific questions about specific materials, I'm happy to talk with you. But let's get into it. We're going to start with paper objects. Paper likes a cool, dry place. And one thing you know you you think of when you think of people handling things in a museum they're always wearing gloves you know but with paper we say no gloves uh, so when you're wearing gloves you lose all your dexterity okay so you can't feel when you're turning pages that it's getting taut that you might rip it so it is less risky to use clean dry hands when handling your paper objects at home and a lot of people like to make notes like on letters saying like you know, this is what this word is if it's getting hard to read. And you can always make that on a separate sheet of paper and store it with it, but some people do make notes on their paper. And if you do, you're gonna wanna use just a normal number two pencil on a hard surface so that pencil isn't poking through or making more of an impression than just your note. A big one, so um, no fasteners on these. That's an easy fix that you can do to really help your paper objects. So if you have binder clips on things, paper clips, rubber bands, uh, oh, glue and tape. Um, all of those will eventually leave a residue or a stain even on your paper, so it's an easy fix. And then we also want to try to leave things as flat and unfolded as possible. And I say that because, you know, if you have something that's been folded for decades and decades, maybe unfolding it might cause more damage. Um, and that's when a conservator or someone could come in and help you with that. But uh, when you think of fibers that make up paper, as they're folded over time, those fibers break, causing the paper to break. And you can see kind of fold lines here. This is a letter from Gettysburg from their online collection. You can see where the paper was folded. So, you know, it does leave impressions. And then books. Books are safe on, in bookcases as long as they're not crammed in and too tight. Here we have a great example from just down the road from the James A. Garfield site in the Memorial Library. So a good rule of thumb also with books, when, you're, when you wanna see them pulling them out of bookcases, it's best to not hook that finger and pull from the top of the spine, because that will you know, eventually hurt the spine, but kind of grabbing from the middle and removing the book, if that makes sense. And I was talking about fasteners, right? So here's an example from West Virginia University of a rusty paper clip that left these stains on this paper. And that's very common. You know, that's something archivists come across all of the time. It's very common to see that staining. But again, removing clips as you can is just gonna be very good for your paper. Okay, and then we can move on to wood. So relative humidity, RH, is important when working with wood. You know, you can think of like a, a door right when it's uh, humid and hot outside that door could swell when it's cool and dry that door could shrink constant expansion and shrinking can eventually lead to cracking so best to move wood objects you know to a controlled environment another point i want to make <laughs> about wood objects are pests you know we've all heard about termites and the damage they can do to homes um, but there are other pests too here we have powder post beetles, they're common in Ohio, and these can bore in, you'll see boring holes, they can bore into wood objects. And one thing you want to look for is frass. Does anyone know what frass is? It's very fun. It's insect excrement. <laughs> uh, so frass is this powdery, it kind of looks like sawdust in that photo, and that is a good indicator that there are active pests 
on or near your wood objects. And again, there might even be little holes, little boring holes that you can see. But if you do find something, if you have something small and manageable and you notice there's frass, you know, you can vacuum that up and then put that object inside of a sealed plastic bag, like a Ziploc or something similar to get, make sure it's sealable, get all of that oxygen out there that will kill the pests eventually. But if it's something larger, then you would need to bring in help, right? Also, if you have some raw edges on wood objects, you know, you want to clean them, keep them clean, but not putting water directly on those raw surfaces, and I'm talking about things that aren't finished, right, that don't have that lacquer on them, because raw wood will just soak up that water and accelerate rotting, okay? And also dust. So dust accumulation on wood attracts moisture, same problem. Next, textiles. So a huge risk with textiles is going to be light. Okay, so light, we have two kinds of light. We have ultraviolet, UV light, and we have visible light. Obviously the sun, a big producer of ultraviolet rays, uh, but also things like fluorescent light bulbs. They also produce a lot of ultraviolet light. LED lights are recommended in homes and in storage facilities and in museums because they don't emit any UV rays. They just emit visible light. However, even visible light, even though it's less damaging over an extended period of time can cause damage as well. So I gotta get all that out there. Okay, light. So light damage is irreversible. And who has seen light damage on a textile? You know, you see like a vibrant color, right? And then all of a sudden that UV light blasts it and we're faded. Yeah. Another risk to textiles are pests again. So this picture I have here this is actually up at the Garfield home. So we have um, an original 1880s wool rug, and it's beautiful and it's huge. But we noticed carpet beetles were infesting that rug. So this led to us trying to figure out, okay, what's causing these beetles? What do we do about it? A lot of vacuuming happened and also assessing the structure. So we noticed that there was water pooling uh, above the window of that room, which attracted a lot of pests and just made a, an environment for those pests to flourish. So taking care of that vacuuming has helped quite a bit. And last year we didn't have evidence of carpet beetles. So I'm gonna go ahead and knock on wood on that one. Uh, right, Todd? <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and knock on wood. Um, but you know, that's another thing to keep in mind. This is a wool rug. So this is a natural fiber. There's proteins in there that larvae of pests love to munch on. So if you have something that's 100% wool, always helpful to keep an eye. Keep an eye on things. And then textiles, uh, if you can, it's best to store them flat. Again, like with the paper, you know, we talk about folding, those fibers folding over, getting stressed and breaking. That happens with textiles as well. If something's too big to lay flat, folding is an option, but we can make a crease buffer. So what I mean by that is you can take tissue. I'm gonna use this foam here as an example. So pretend like this is tissue. You can roll this up kind of like this and have your textile over this lump here, keeping the textile from creasing on this end. It just protects those fibers a little more. Okay, metal. So a moist environment around metal, surrounding metal is going to cause that metal to corrode quicker. Metals like very low humidity, so I'm like around 30%, which we get to in the winter time in Ohio. But in the summer, it would be very costly to maintain that in a large space. So again, might not be feasible to do, but keeping a stable environment is best. I also put in a table here, which is in a handout that I have, of how to uh, identify your metals. So knowing what kind of metal you have is a huge step forward in how to store it correctly. So you can, you can uh, see signs of, okay, it's corroding this way or oxidizing this way. So you can look up your type of metal and know what actions can be taken. And also, you know, if you had to bring in someone like a conservator, they would want to know what type of metal. And then dusting metal, also important because again, dust attracts moisture and moisture will cause metal to corrode quicker. So dusting, you're just gonna wanna use something really soft. So in the museum world, we use cloth diapers a lot to dust because they're like 100% cotton. 
so I know they won't be damaging things. We also use brushes, but I'm not talking paint brushes, right? When you think of a paintbrush, those are really like immovable, hard bristles, and there's usually a metal edge around those. And I say, no thank you. We don't want that because it could scratch or abrade our things. Uh, so a natural fiber brush, and I have an example as well that I can show later. So we haven't talked about gloves since the paper, you know, using gloves is an option for textiles and for wood if you want to. But for metal, I encourage you to use gloves, whether it be cotton or nitrile. Nitrile gloves don't emit any powder like the latex gloves do, so those are kind of the standard. And oil on hands, on your hands, significantly impact metals, and rather quickly as well. So here we have an example. This is a fingerprint. This is from the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology in Michigan. And they kept an eye on a fingerprint on metal for six months. And this was only after six months of that fingerprint being out there. So it's, it's starting to tarnish the surface of that metal already after six months. Photographic material. So a really big risk to photographs is light, no matter what kind of photograph you have. It runs the gamut. In something older, like a daguerreotype, it could cause extreme fading. So a dark place for photographs is 10 out of 10. We love it. And then I don't know how, um, if you ever want to go down a very deep hole, start looking into how daguerreotypes and ambrotypes were made. It is fascinating. And people like craftsmen still kind of do it today, like hobbyists. And it is amazing. So uh, daguerreotypes were kind of the first popular mode of photography. And they are put the images on a silver plate. The image itself is recorded on a thin layer of silver mercury, actually. So it's a very thin image on this plate. And usually it's put with a glass overlay and in a case, like a case like that. So these, these photographs, although they look sturdy, you know, they're in a case, it's big, they're actually extremely fragile. So if you need to remove that for whatever reason, I highly suggest going to a professional to have that done. Uh, because again, they're just extremely fragile. So after daguerreotypes, you know, we had ambrotypes, which are basically the same thing. Instead of silver, a silver plate, it was on a glass plate, so still extremely fragile in how it's made. But it was less uh, labor intensive, so it was more economical for people to switch to ambrotypes. But we have the same risks here with the ambrotypes. How do you know the difference between a daguerreotype and an ambrotype? A daguerreotype will have almost like a mirror-like quality to it. As you kind of move it around, you might lose the image wholly, and you'll see that silver backing, you know, kind of reflected up. Ambrotypes don't have that mirror image, uh, but a professional can certainly help you identify. Um, and then we also, I also wanted to talk about tintypes. These were very popular. It was an even, even cheaper way of making photographs. Tintypes really sprung up during the Civil War and they were more durable. So, oh, and tin types, so they were on a plate of metal. So, you know, we had silver plate, we have a glass plate. Tin types are usually on an iron plate, so tin types can actually rust. Uh, so keep an eye out for rusting on your old photographs. And I think tin types are what's most associated with the Civil War because of how durable those were. And then we also have carte de visite, which this is an example of here. So we have an image on a card backing. So usually it was a, an image taken and then glued onto like a hard piece of paper, like a card stock situation. And those, we typically store those in photo sleeves, or, but you can store those like just kind of separately in, in a paper envelope or a folder. And then also I do want to hit on scanning. I know I said, you know, light, watch out, light, bad. But scanning your photographs, no matter when they're from, and, if, and you would need help scanning a daguerreotype or an ambrotype for sure, but the carte de visite, the cabinet cards, and any other photographs past that, scanning that is a, is a great idea, because yes, you're blasting it with light for a minute, but then you can share that photograph with family and friends digitally or print it out and save that original in its nice dark, stable environment, which is what it likes. So any questions on those materials I just went through? Okay. 
Um, we'll go ahead and move on then to protective storage. So I brought with me a lot of storage options. I do want to say that you know these are not the cheapest materials. So keep that in mind. This is not something you have to do all at once. Uh, you can slowly get like an acid-free folder every now and then to store something in. It's also something that isn't necessarily needed if you have a stable environment, okay? So all of these protective storage ideas that I'm bringing you, these are just gonna elongate you know, your object's lifetime, but a stable environment is number one, is what I really wanna hit. So yeah, we can just kinda look through these. I've got, um, I brought some, so this is like a, we call this an object box. This is just an acid-free box. So when I say acid-free, this is inert. So it will not off-gas, which is a very technical term in my field, but as it decomposes, it won't off-gas affecting things inside of it. So if you think like you have a, a cardboard box with things inside of it, as that cardboard disintegrates, it's releasing chemicals, it's off-gassing, and those chemicals are hurting the things inside of that box. Wild. So yeah, so this is a typical object box. Um, you can pad this out with foam like I have or tissue paper, acid-free tissue paper, and put objects in here and they're nice and happy. Um, I've also got you know, acid-free folders which you can put letters in. These are relatively cheaper and they're extremely helpful. I also have archival photo sleeves here. So it is possible to have like an archivally safe photo album, basically, as long as you keep it in the dark. So this as well, you know, is inert. Um, and then I've got a document box. So you'll, you will see these in archives a lot of times with these folders full of things inside of it. And it just kind of opens like this and you store things in there. It's another option. Also, I got a big box. So this is a big banker's box, acid-free banker's box that you can put things in. And then we have foam. So this is called ethafoam. And this is also acid-free, very object safe, and can be used for many things, whether you want to use it to help you fold textiles or put in the base of the box to have your things in so it's nice and cushy. And then I also brought with me like some of my supplies, like my soft bristle brush that I use for dusting. I have many, this is just one. <laughs> Don't just carry this one around. Um, and then an example of cotton versus nitrile gloves. So please feel free to come up and, and take a look at those. Where can you buy the answer free boxes? Oh yes, <laughs> great lead in. Okay, resources and handout. I, you, here are the suppliers, by the way, a list of suppliers. Um, where you can purchase these things. Again, they are on the expensive side. Number one thing is a stable environment, but those are just a few. Uh, and one thing I really wanted to point to are, is what call, they're called conservagrams. So there's a National Park Service publication. Uh, they're all online. They're little snapshots of how to care for different types of materials. So things I didn't cover here, or maybe something older or more modern, um, the conservagrams really cover it and you can just Google conservagrams and it'll take you right to them, but uh, they're very well done and very easy to follow. So I highly encourage checking those out, uh, places to get those. Has anyone heard of these? I know you've heard of, U of Amazon and Uline probably, but Hollinger, Gaylord, Gaylord yes. Perfect, yeah, because all those papers, they're going to, yep, mm -hmm. mm hmm yeah. And if you decide you want to turn your house into a museum, they sell exhibit cases. <laughs> <laughs> but Hollinger is going to specialize in boxes, for example. Here are my citations for this presentation, but I did want to highlight checking out the, the National Archives website. There's a lot of resources on there for paper objects and photographs. Definitely check that out. Um, I highly encourage it. Okay, and then here's me with my favorite Civil War general. Anyone know who it is? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yes, um, so yeah, does anyone, and I'm happy to answer any questions or if you wanna come up and look at the supplies, we can chat about it. But thank you all, thank you all.